All right, well, we'll get going here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the April 27th uh, webinar. My name is Andrea Shipley, and um, I'm the project coordinator here at the Wyoming Telehealth Network. And um, I am going to turn it over to Faith. Um, who will get us started and has a great panel and will be moderating this webinar. So um, Faith, thank you so much. And um, I will let you take it over. Great, thank you, Andrea. Thanks for that. And I'm gonna just take just a second to share my screen. Um, and it, I do use more than one screen, so bear with me um, as I switch from putting the presentation from one screen to another. Uh, that's just the way it works. Okay, now you should be able to see um, see my screen. And we're going to go ahead today and talk a little bit more about patient engagement. And as you can see, it's a very long title, but mastering the workflow in your clinic for improving patient engagement using care coordination. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is a part of a three part series. Um, as you can see, I did the first one last month. Um, and so if you happen to have missed it last month, no worries. One, it's recorded, but two, I'm going to go over a few slides here um, today just to give a really, really big, quick overview, overview of what care coordination has to do with telehealth and how those interact and what that looks like for patient engagement. So I have a couple of slides. So if you were on last time, these are repeat slides, but there's only just a couple. Um, but if you weren't on last time, this will just kind of set the stage, I think, a little bit for us to be moving forward. And then as you can see, part two, what we're going to be talking about today, we are using a care coordinator panel presentation. So we do have three care coordinators on who practice in different types of settings in Wyoming. And um, when we get to their part, I'll introduce them to you. And it's going to be an amazing presentation from all of them. And then uh, Andrea already talked about part three, and part three will be in May. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. So as I talked about last month, but I always think it's important to kind of just center us just a little bit and kind of put us in the space of delivering care. So no matter how we deliver care, if we're delivering care in person or we're delivering care virtually, the key is always to remember that the care must be patient-centered. Now, the term patient-centered care has been around a long time. Actually, it was first coined in 2001. So that's over 20 years now, right? But I still come up with two people and ask them about patient-centered care. And when you hear the words, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we need to provide patient-centered care, of course. So it's like, well, what, is, what does that mean to you? Sometimes people can't articulate what that means. And I think that when you can't articulate what it means, it's pretty hard to actually put it into practice because it means something different or people have a different viewpoint. So I want to bring us together on the same viewpoint. And this is a definition of patient-centered care that actually was put together by the Institute of Medicine that no longer exists. The Institute of Medicine in its original form no longer exists. It still is around today under the title of the National Academy of Medicine. So if you're looking up IOM, those were the, you know, we love our alphabet soup. It, you're not, you're probably going to see references to the National Academy of Medicine. Same thing, new title, new collaborations. But that's how old this definition is. But I still find that there are people who sometimes don't quite understand. So I want us to kind of pull this definition apart for just a minute. I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but just a minute, pull it apart and have our brains be thinking about this in the concepts of of telehealth. So what is patient-centered care? It's providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual preferences. I'm going to stop right there before I go forward. Individual preferences. I think that if people don't know anything about telehealth, it's pretty hard for them to prefer a telehealth visit. Um, and sometimes in the, when you get and you're getting started with telehealth, the other thing that can happen is people can be afraid of the technology. But when you have trusting relationships that you have built, and that's what our care coordinators are going to talk about here today, and that's how this ties in with care coordination, then over time, just like think about it, we all want to build relationships in person to get started, of course. But then after we have relationships, how many of us are picking up the phone 
and talking to people on the phone to build or to actually maintain and or grow that relationship. What about now with FaceTime? What about Skype? What about like all of these kinds of things that are out there that now sometimes it's preferable for us to be able to say, hey, you know, I, I don't need to pop over your house to ask you this question. I can just talk with you. I can call you. We can do a Zoom meeting. We can do a FaceTime. We can do whatever that looks like. So um, I think that over time, sometimes we talk about particular elderly population. Well, they're never going to prefer a telehealth visit. You're going to hear some stories today where maybe they do. Um, and there are the right circumstances for that. And then, of course, we'll go to the next, which is the individual patient needs. I think one of the things that came out of COVID or out of the pandemic was that people needed to still see their providers. And this need might have, you know, trumped, so to speak, their preference, right? Because they needed to make sure they were seeing their providers doing some of those things. So telehealth was, for some, their only option. So they got used to it and they were able to use it. And if they had a good experience with that, it can then turn into a preference, right? If they had a bad experience with that, maybe not. Um, and then the other part is values. Absolutely, it's super important that we never, ever, ever forget that any kind of care we're delivering needs to be congruent with the patient's values. And that is what guides all of our clinical decisions. So I just wanted us to take a minute to talk about that patient-centered care and hopefully puts us in that space. So when we start talking also about patient engagement, one of the things that can happen and why care coordination is so important in this endeavor is patients are getting bombarded. They are getting bombarded with information from lots of sources. Many of our patients are seeing specialists, they're seeing other health providers that maybe one doesn't know that the other one is you know, providing care. Some of the things that I always like to remind people of is, you know, don't forget that our dentists are part of our healthcare team. Sometimes, we don't even ask our patients about their dental care. Um, sometimes the dentists and the primary care don't even know each other. They don't know what medications people are on. They don't understand what's happening with some of these pieces. And we have to be careful that with specialists or you know, other health providers, that as they're telling patients all this information, if they don't know the whole story about the patient, then they might be giving conflicting information. And that's where that building that trust and building that relationship with that care coordinator who typically is connected with the primary care practice is the person that can be that keeper of all the information and really help patients um, make sure they can make it through all that information and decipher what's most important so that they don't get information overload to the point where I'm not going to do anything different now. Right. It's like, no, I, there's so much information. It's paralyzing. I'm going to do nothing. We want people to live their best life and what their values are and really helping them to do what it is they want to do. That's where care coordination comes into effect. And that's where when we talk about what is health. I always want to make sure we talk about not just health care, but what is health. And that really it's that the perception of health and we can't tell other people what it is they need to be healthy. We need to find out from them what it is they believe health is and what they want that to look like in their lives so that we can help them with the health promotion, promoting the health that they want. This isn't about giving advice. It isn't about changing people's ways. It's about helping them to change in the ways they want to change. And so really putting all these pieces together, we can do that in so many different ways. Um, just the typical face-to-face -face office visit is a way, but there's so many other ways that we can really make health promotion and the perception of people's health and help them live the life they wanna live. And technology is a part of that. So with that as kind of that overview or introduction piece that I wanted to talk a little bit about, I want to take a minute here and introduce you to three amazing women um, and health professionals that are indeed providing care coordination around our state. I'm going to let them give all of their backgrounds as we get into each one of them, um, but I'm just going to give you a quick little overview so you can understand 
in the state where we're talking about. So Sharon Enrolling is a social worker and she works with Ivinson Medical Group in Laramie. And so just kind of put that little pin in the map for you. For you. Uh, Jerry Slover is an RN and she works with Hot Springs Health and she works with five different clinics that are all part of Hot Springs Health um, in Thermopolis, Warland, Basin, Riverton, and Shoshone. So that's kind of her area. So again, put your pin in like the middle of the state. Um, and then Natasha um, Urbanic is an RN and she works for Live Health and Live Health is out of Cheyenne, Wyoming, um, but she covers territories with her patients in Cheyenne, in Laramie and in Northern Colorado. So she kind of has that region and that area. So that gives you kind of that background, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves to you um, in a little bit more detail because I think it's important for you all to know where they come from, what their backgrounds are, what their practice settings are, and how they engage patients. And we'll talk about um, some scenarios, some examples of some of the things that they've been amazingly successful at. Okay, so as we get started, I'm going to start with Sheridan Rowling. So again, Sheridan is with the Ivinson Medical Group in, um, in Laramie. And Sheridan, how about you just get started by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, what brought you to this role, and then describe for us your practice setting and some of the things you do in care coordination. Hi, everyone. I'm Sheridan Rowling. Um, as Faith mentioned, I am a social worker currently currently working towards my full licensure um, with hopes of it being completed by end of July. Um, I originally have a background in acute mental health, uh, but with the transition, primarily in the pandemic, I was looking forward to slowing down in theory a little bit and um, getting out of an inpatient setting. And that is when my position here at Ivinson became available. Um, in engaging the community through chronic care management just sounded like such an amazing opportunity, especially with the challenges and changes that were coming through with COVID. Um, so my practice setting, I work, um, like Faith said, in Ivinson Medical Group, which is attached to Ivinson Memorial Hospital here in Laramie, Wyoming. I work with Dr. Emma Biori, a geriatrician, and Dr. Tanya Woods, a clinical pharmacist, um, who is also a professor at the School of Pharmacy at UW. Um, for Dr. Biori, she has approximately 400 patients on her panel, and we're always adding more, it seems like. And additionally, on our team, we have a patient care tech, Mackenzie, who will be leaving us shortly to start medical school. Um, Peter is our nurse, and then Dr. Woods also has a medical assistant, and fortunately, through our GWEP at the university, we also get the privilege of having a pharmacy intern to help work with our care coordination as well. Um, in my daily role as a care coordinator, I work largely on creative outreach to patients and just touching base with them, um, whether it be calls to the patient, home visits, or reaching out to family. If a more acute need arises that is more medically focused, I triage as best as I am able and send it off to the appropriate person, typically our nurse, Peter. Um, I additionally work with um, any mental health needs that arise, which is a benefit of my earlier background in acute mental health. Um, and so that's kind of my practice day to day. It changes constantly. So when I try to nail down what I do, um, a new day happens and it completely throws what I think I do kind of sideways. Um, and I, I apologize, I forgot to mention, Ivinson Memorial Hospital is the first recognized age-friendly practice in the state of Wyoming. Um, with that, we focus on the four M's. Uh, I believe Faith has mentioned this before, but just as a refresher, the four M's are what matters to the patient, medication and how it impacts their health, mobility and mentation. So using that evidence-based practice, 
to engage our care more thoroughly with our patients. Great, Sheridan, I know that you have some pretty unique pieces that happen in your practice. Um, and um, I know that you've used a little bit of technology. You've done some telehealth with some of your patients. Some of those you've helped set up, some of them you've talked through that. Can you provide us with uh, maybe just a story or an example of one that was really impactful for what was happening in, um, in the times um, and in the vast distances that happen in, um, in your area and in the patient population that Dr. Uh, Biori serves? Yes. So with the pandemic, telehealth became very popular, um, as we all know, uh, largely with our older adults, we focused primarily on phone calls. But as we were able to make our team a little bit more robust, we were able to introduce telehealth services. Um, one scenario in particular that it was found to be extremely helpful, we had a patient hospitalized um, and broke her, their leg, if I recall. Um, but they lived about 40 miles out of town and she needed hospital follow-up. Given that it's Wyoming and 40 miles west of Laramie is more remote and challenging to get to sometimes even in the summer, um, depending on whether we had to do a telehealth visit this individual was at minimum a two person transfer into a vehicle and in significant pain. So requesting them come to come into the clinic on winter roads was just unrealistic. And um, so I was able to support the family and the patient in getting telehealth set up and ensuring a good connection for the visit. So the patient could have a hospital follow-up, see how their pain was being managed, ensure that physical therapy was going well and um, just engaging her needs at where they are. Because like I mentioned earlier, um, the four M's are really critical to our team and this patient's goals is to remain in home and age safely there. And so to meet them where they're at, telehealth became a huge piece of that puzzle for us. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and then the last question that I want to talk just a little bit about is you do have the opportunity, and I know a lot of people on the call who are watching or listening are probably jealous, but you do have the opportunity to have a clinical pharmacist that is a part of your practice. So I know that Dr. Woods also um, works with medications being one of the big four M's, right? Works with patients, mm -hmm. particularly the geriatric population. How has she used um, some of the telehealth and in the care coordination space to work with those patients? Yes. So um, I will say, I think I am quite spoiled with the team I get to work with and I am, will be forever grateful for everything. Um, but yes, so Dr. Woods is an integral part to the care coordination program that we do. She's able to utilize um, video calls or phone calls to help support patients with diabetes management. Um, for another program we do is transition care management and if needed, she helps support those med recs. Um, but with her support for the CCM program, doing those phone calls, even a home visit to set up a med box to ensure its accuracy, we're able to build complex CCM time, um, which just increases the revenue stream and continues to contribute to our great program. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I thought what I would do is if it was okay with people, if you have any questions of Sheridan in particular, throw them in the chat. And then at the end, we'll have time to ask all of our panelists questions. So again, thank you Sheridan um, for that wonderful presentation. And you'll get to see some of the uniquenesses of the various practices as we kind of go forward. 
So next, um, I would love to introduce to you Jerry Slover. She is a registered nurse. She does work at Hot Springs Health, and I've talked a little bit in her intro that she does care coordination model in more of that regional model where she supports five clinics. Um, and so how does how is she able to do that? With that, Jerry, let us know. Start by telling us a little bit about yourself. We want to know your background, what you bring to the table, what you bring to your patients, um, your care coordination practice setting um, and again how you engage a little bit with patients and what that looks like. All right thank you. Um, yes I am Jerry Slover. Um, I've been a nurse for a long time and my background that brought me to where I am today um, I former business owner so I really understand and value um, customer service and when I say customer service is on behalf of the facilities and the patient I feel the easier we can make things with providers and with patients together, um, making that whole picture more streamlined it definitely um, increases satisfaction for all. Um, and then as far as a nurse goes with my background there, I have been, of course, acute care, clinic nurse, um, infusion oncology, and surgical. And with all of that background, I've been able to use all of those areas and assisting my chronic care ma managed patients, and I have 45 of them, um, being able to educate them through their pre-op experience, through referrals. Um, also another thing that happens because we are super rural is we have to refer for out for <clears throat> majority of specialties and none of our electronic records talk to each other. So I can be that piece to kind of look ahead and see what will be needed for a follow-up visit, um, make sure the doctors got the office notes, make sure they know that they just had all of their teeth pulled or, you know, whatever. So when they come in, I can kind of make that picture more clear for the provider. Also, all of the patients that I follow get my phone number so they can call um, for a direct need. Um, and I can streamline their experience by just reaching out to making sure a referral went through or communication with a provider or making sure if there was a hiccup with um, getting a medication filled, what happened, and I can problem solve that. Everything except room patients. So because, of, because I'm not rooming patients, I can do everything else that would be needed through the clinic as far as referrals, um, clarifying, verifying medications, um, educating patients, um, and I can take an extended phone call for you know, a need that a patient has where they, they just need someone to listen a little bit longer and to really um, hear what's going on with them. Um, and then as far as the, the setting, I work predominantly, I'd say, oh gosh, it's been about 90% remotely because of some things that have changed with our clinics. So I mostly work in my home. And the part of that rural thing, I used to not be able to Zoom at all, speaking of technology also. Um, this is Starlink. And I think we are changing satellites or something. So I do get a little bit of a freeze every now and then. But before, I couldn't even Zoom. So technology is getting better out here on the prairie. Um, so, okay, so that's the five clinics. Um, I also work with pharmacy to verify, clarify, and educate um, patients with their med lists. And so, Jerry, I have a question for you. Um, so, one of the things a little different in your practice than in Sheridan's practice is when you talk about working with the pharmacist. What, what kinds of pharmacists are you interacting with? Are you interacting with the patient's personal pharmacist, the pharmacy, uh, the downtown pharmacy? Tell me a little bit about what that interaction looks like. And, um, and then I'd love for you to follow up with any stories that you have that have been a huge impact in patient's care um, because you were able to do all of this preliminary work with them. Okay. And hopefully I don't freeze during this. So for the mostly I work with the local pharmacy slash the patient's pharmacy. And that is, that is um, ensuring that their med lists are correct and um, really just assisting to make sure our orders have went through. 
And then there has been a few instances where a patient had went to another provider and was prescribed um, Eliquis when they were on warfarin by another provider and neither one of those providers knew about that. And I was able to put that, you know, all that to everyone's attention. So that's kind of how I work with pharmacy really is just the as needed um, education and clarification. Um, okay, so then a story, one of my recent stories that I was really happy to help a patient with is I had a gentleman call and say that he um, needed some help. He had a spot on his ear that he had made an appointment with his dermatologist and it would take, he wouldn't be able to get in until September. Well, since I followed this gentleman for over a year, I've gotten to know him quite well. And I know that for him to call me that it, it's probably quite concerning. So I got off the phone with him and did some research and I called his dermatologist. And yes, in fact, they could not see him till September. However, they did have a walk-in clinic that week and if that patient would call tomorrow, you know, the next morning at eight o'clock, he would be able to be seen same day. And the patient had searched me out in a public setting and <laughs> thanked me because the very next day he was able to get in and get that spot removed from his ear. So. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Because as I said in the introduction, um, healthcare is confusing and it's confusing for patients. And for him to probably call, and he probably just called and asked for an appointment, and they're like, okay, here's the next appointment. But that relationship piece that you have with that patient, so that you were able to say, wow, if he's calling me, he's concerned. The people at the dermatology clinic don't know him as well as you know him. So being able to connect those dots and to make those things happen um, are really important pieces. So thank you so much. And I love how you talk about the technology is better, <laughs> but still there are some issues in some of our rural America, you know, rural places in Wyoming, rural America in general. Um, and at that same time, it's in all our EMRs don't talk to each other, but that doesn't mean it's something we just say, they don't talk to each other. There's nothing to, that we can do. No, you can do a lot as care coordinators. You really do connect all those dots and in those technology spaces and, and all of those pieces. So thank you so much um, for um, your information on that. And again, we'll hold questions for Jerry at the end. Um, and so she is very busy with 145 patients. Um, and so being able to pop into all those different clinics, and I know she spends a lot of time on the road too, because she visits other places and does community visits and has to pop in in people's homes every now and then just for that additional support. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with that, thank you, uh, Jerry. We're gonna go ahead and move on to Natasha. So again, we talked a little bit about Natasha at the very beginning. She is an RN. Um, she does work in Cheyenne in a different kind of care setting model, um, which is a home-based care model. So I'm gonna let Natasha tell us about herself, her background, what brought her here, and then explain your um, practice model and your practice setting and how you came to care coordination. Natasha? Thank you so much, Faith. My name is Natasha, and I even recognize some of the participants in on the call. So I was born in Cheyenne, so I am an expert in my area, I would say. Um, but through my organization, and so we are of an organization, uh, an interdisciplinary team of like social workers, case managers, and new, new, more new than everything, the medical part of the team. So we've got a medical director, we have nursing now, and we have an MA on our team. We work outside of the primary care clinics, outside of the hospitals to provide um, chronic care management. Um, I've seen chronic care management be an idea through my experiences in the hospital and primary care setting, but it's definitely become a real thing. And Faith is a good leader in the community for chronic care management and what it should look like. I've learned the most just in the time working with Faith, so I'm appreciative of that. So our organization functions independently outside of those bigger organizations. Uh, we are a referral-based organization, and what we're finding is our primary care providers in our area are finding out that we do chronic care management and we're assisting patients with their chronic illnesses. In a field where the demand is far more than what we have available, this is becoming very important to them, and here's why. 
Physicians work because they know that they want to serve the patient and assist the patient to the best outcomes. But with all of the things that these patients are needing, especially when you have five plus chronic illnesses, having chronic care management is important. And so we're receiving these referrals for chronic care management. And some of the things that um, my organization provides is um, case management, behavioral health, chronic care management, and remote patient monitoring. And some of the platforms that we use to provide these services is just in-home visits. So I do visit patients in home, especially if they're more complex. So say I have a patient with diabetes, congestive heart failure, and COPD, and some patients do have all three of those. Sometimes an in-person visit is helpful just to help that patient navigate all of those things. And like Faith had said, um, there's specialists, there's dentists, there are audiologists. Um, our diseases affect all of those areas, our eyes, our feet. And so you're kind of that person that just takes all of those open wires and you plug them in for the patient. And we've been able to do that um, through telephone, through Google Meet, through in-person visits. Um, and one of um, the most important two components to the organization that I feel um, I'd like to highlight is the need for mental health with chronic care management and being able to have mental health um, providers assist patients. Um, when we have these chronic illnesses and they debilitate us to the point where it's affecting our mentation, um, becoming well um, and becoming independent um, and having that um, strength to be independent comes from mental health. Um, but also re uh, remote patient monitoring. Uh, the physicians in the primary care office and even us as chronic care managers, we can't be in the home 24-7. And so to be able to access um, data uh, relating to the patient's illnesses is important. And so we have people who can help reinforce and educate patients on how to manage, identify those things within their home, and then identify when something's going wrong that needs attention, and then they access their healthcare provider. So really, we're empowering the patient to be the most independent functional person, um, and they really appreciate that because really that is patient-centered care um, that we're teaching them and that we're not causing a reliance on us. Great. And I know you mentioned Google Meets. So talk to me a little bit about you guys are um, probably in the forefront of using telehealth on a regular basis. So tell us a little bit about um, some telehealth that you've um, helped patients get set up with or what that looks like and how you kind of went over some of those hurdles of telehealth and, um, and how your patients respond to the use of telehealth. So surprisingly, you think, you know, the aging population that um, technologically, you know, it's going to take a lot of assistance. But what I'm finding is they are just on par, just like I am. Um, but one of the benefits of being um, outpatient is that Live Health has technically, you know, we have technology that supports us all outpatient. And so we've been able to use that same technology to assist our patients in accessing their providers. Um, so sometimes you can't um, fully depend on a patient to have, you know, an iPhone, an iPad or a computer in their home um, and they still need to access care. And so, um, you know, we'll definitely meet the patient where they are, um, you know, just like Sheridan had said, um, we can set them up on telehealth, connect them with their provider, be there to assist the patient in navigating that appointment with the provider um, utilizing tablet, um, their own cell phone, maybe they just need to download the app. Um, I've had patients with um, agoraphobia, um, a mental health um, uh, impairment that has limited their um, independence and in getting to and from the physician's office. And so I've helped specifically that patient be able to download their patient portal application so that they can log on and see their patient, uh, their, their provider. Um, and their provider is um, happy that we're doing this for them. I have seen in this instance, particularly patients no-show visits, instead of just having someone come alongside them, meet them where they are and help them rebuild that path. Um, I've had patients fired from clinics just because they haven't um, been seen in, in more than 18 months. And, and all along, it was this, this barrier that could have been extinguished. And so... 
uh, we're really seeing a lot of benefit in meeting patients in their home and connecting them electronically through telehealth to their providers. And there are portals, there's lots of them. Great, thank you so much for um, sharing all of those things. You have all three of these practice models are different, um, but they're all super successful in what it is they're doing. So with that, um, one, before we take questions, do each of you have any final statements, something that you thought afterwards, ooh, I wish I would have said? Um, we can kind of go in order. Sheridan, do you have anything you'd like to add? I do not. Okay, Jerry, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, and Natasha, are you good? I think I'm good. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and move into questions. So the easiest way I find to do questions in this setting is um, there's not a huge amount of people on the call right now, so you are lucky. So you can certainly just unmute yourself and yell out a question. Um, that would be wonderful. Just let us know who you are addressing that to. Um, or at the same time, if you would prefer not to do that, you can certainly go ahead and um, put it in the chat box and I'll go ahead and read that out. At the moment, it doesn't look like I have anything in the chat box. So are there any questions from anyone that they'd like to just unmute themselves and ask our participants? I had a question. Um, it's pretty general, but I was just curious, was there ever a situation or um, a barrier that was has been overcome but was kind of a struggle to get there and do you have any advice or anything like that for maybe um, providers or clinics who are experiencing the same type of thing? Go ahead, Natasha, you unmuted first and then I'll let Sheridan go next. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I think, um, I think providers do identify these, um, you know, these challenges with patients and, and accessing them. Um, you know, they have such a short time with their patient. I would say that chronic care management is becoming such a community prominent um, thing um, or platform. And I feel like if you just research in your community who is providing chronic care management and find that chronic care manager, really, we do all the work after that. So we just need a phone call or referral saying, hey, I have this patient with complex needs. I'm having a difficult time. And we've even had primary care providers already identify this. I mean, I've had um, one particular provider who's sending me more referrals than I can even take now because he's seen how much it can help with those complex patients. And so just researching in your community who provides chronic care management um, and just finding that chronic care manager that can help. Great, thank you, Natasha. So I'll just add to that, that um, this, this program started, as you know, as a Medicare program and Medicare has had issues. <laughs> I've been a nurse for 40 years, so I can kind of go through all of those pieces. So sometimes when we talk about programs like this and it's a new program, new as in 2015, so not super new, but 2015, it went into effect um, and people are like, oh yeah, it's going to be too hard. There's too many things to do, too many hoops to jump through. It's just going to be too difficult. Well, I will, I will tell you, that's actually not true. Um, this is probably one of the best things Medicare ever did. And I have been a nurse executive in two different hospitals. I've seen the rules. I've jumped through lots of hoops. And I will tell you, these chronic care management rules and all the things they put together really are the most forward thinking and positive and not difficult to do. So I will second what Natasha says um, when providers are on the call to say, you know, all you have to do is identify these patients and let us have them. We will do all the work. It's a true story. And once you guys are doing all the work, um, they really do see the benefits. So, um, but it is something that it's that whole, it sounds too good to be true. Therefore, I'm gonna stay away from it. Um, probably is a huge barrier that I've seen as I help practices around the state and around the country, quite frankly, but in the state um, implement chronic care management. There's always a little bit of skepticism. So I think the skepticism might be one of the biggest barriers, but it is actually, growing. Um, so I will echo that that what Natasha just said. So Sheridan, you also unmuted. So what's the barrier that you'd like to talk about? 
Uh, well, one that comes to mind since we are on the telehealth network call is just getting my patients um, interested in wanting to pursue telehealth and kind of that fear of technology and what it looks like for them. So um, my team was fortunate enough through the Wyoming Center on Aging to get a grant for iPads to help support the telehealth uh, movement with COVID. And some of my patients, again, very hesitant, but struggle to get into clinic due to roads or just illness in general. And um, I was able to go out and do a home visit with them and show them the iPad and kind of use it as a learning tool instead of just saying, here's all the information about this iPad. Here's how you get onto all of these different websites. Um, we kind of introduced it slowly. so using it as an alarm for medication reminders. Um, and that went really well. And they're like, oh, okay, this isn't the most terrifying thing in the world. How do I get on to call my grandkid? Because they'd rather talk to grandkids than providers, which I totally get. And so then we got them comfortable with making those calls um, and slowly just building up their um, trust in technology and um, so they're more willing to be seen instead of canceling those appointments, like Natasha said, giving them that other avenue to be seen and have the care that they deserve um, through a different resource. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jerry, did you have a barrier that you wanted to talk about overcoming? Um, yes. Um, I would say when I first took um, took on this program, one of the biggest barriers was um, fellow staff members really not being bought in and finding value and not really understanding. And then just by over time, giving the customer service to them and to the provider and to the patient, um, over time, I even noticed, even in the doctor's notes, he would say, um, patient was referred to Jerry Slover, our chronic care management nurse, she will be calling you on Friday. <laughs> and so then I started seeing, oh, okay. Then a little, you know, little by little as, as um, you know, follow through, making sure that referrals get made, making sure that we're touching base, um, returning messages promptly to patients and to providers and um, staff members having their burden eased um, over time that that barrier has kind of went away. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And um, for anyone who ever has heard me speak on care coordination, it's all about relationships, right? So it all starts with relationships and you've got to build trust. And I think that our panelists have done an amazing job in working in their areas and building that trust as um, they didn't all tout their horns, but they're all managing well over a hundred patients. So each practice, I think Jerry said you're at 145. Um, Natasha's hitting right at a 100. Sheridan, I, you had like 110 or so. So this isn't that they're doing this for 10 people, right? We're doing this, this, just these three are doing this for well over 300 people in Wyoming. And that is a huge feat. And it's, you know, we're a pretty small populated state. Um, and there are other care coordination programs in the state as well. Um, but I picked these three to be on the panel today after I was asked to uh, to facilitate this panel discussion uh, because I did think that their practices were unique. They had different aspects and they're all amazing. So with that, um, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy um, to answer them, but I don't see any more in the chat. Okay, Andrea, I think I'll turn it over back over to you. Thank you so much. Right. Well, um, you know, like I said, this is incredible. Um, Faith, thank you so much for putting this together. And um, thank you to the panelists who bring a wealth of expertise. Um, the fact that you're treating that many people using telehealth um, really just elevates your street cred on telehealth usage in Wyoming. You guys are stars. Thank you so much for being champions. 
Um, if there are further questions, um, feel free to email um, and, and let us know. But um, we will look forward to your feedback in those evaluations and see what you might have on your mind for further webinars. Thank you all for being here today. And we'll see you next month when we'll go over um, how to create that long-term um, flow of training uh, our workforce as, as people continue to come in and out of um, the doors at our clinics. So thanks everybody so much. Take care, have a great day, enjoy that sunshine.